If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Matthew chapter 10, and we are looking tonight at verse 28. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The last word we sang tonight in the hymn called, My God, My God, Oh, Why Have You Forsaken Me, was the word fear. And the line that ends the hymn goes, I will pay my vows in full where men hold him in fear. This is a verse that on first reading may seem to be talking about the devil. But in actual fact, our New King James Version is correct in capitalizing the hymn because this is a passage that is actually speaking about the fear of God. In this verse... As you know, Jesus was giving instructions to his apostles. They were being sent out for their first missionary journey, and he pinpointed for them where their weakness will be on this trip as they declare their faith and proclaim the good news. And that weakness will be fear. When Steve Gunderson was here uh, several months ago from England, he told you that now there exists in England uh, a law that says that anyone speaking publicly cannot proclaim that any other religion is false. So whereas you used to be able to go to the speaker's corner in Hyde Park in London, and basically say anything you wanted to, you no longer can say anything like Islam is false, Hinduism is false, or Zen Buddhism is false. This is why it is so important that we in America get ready for a future time of persecution, a future time of discrimination against Christianity because as I've been pointing out to you in studying the Gnostic tendencies in our culture which are reflected in the New Age movement, basically the philosophy is any religion goes except Christianity. Any religion is tolerable and toleratable but that which proclaims the exclusive claims of Jesus. It is for this reason that we will have to become people who faithfully declare the contents of this book. And so we must learn that when we share our faith and we speak of the passage where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And we speak of the passage where Peter said, there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That all we're doing is faithfully reporting the words of a book. In other words, the day may come when they may shoot the messenger. But let us always be sure that the message is the one that the Bible proclaims and that they know that while they may try to eliminate the Christian who is telling them the message, that their problem is really not with that Christian. 
Their problem is with the message. And many people have a problem with a message that this passage forces us to look at. Because the message is simply this. There is a hell, first of all. There is a doctrine of everlasting punishment. Many evangelicals are now to the place where they're very uncomfortable in declaring this. And they, if they feel that if they must declare it, that they want to somehow minimize it so that it is a doctrine that simply affects the soul. But of course, this passage won't let us uh, get off the hook that easily. This passage declares that somehow both the soul and the body are involved. And so, Orthodox Christian teaching throughout the centuries has been that eventually the wicked who reject the Lord Jesus Christ as their God and King, as their only Savior, and as the one in whom alone they possess salvation, will in fact be banished to everlasting punishment. And what Jesus is saying to his disciples is simply this. You're going to meet a lot of people on your journey that will make you fear. They'll even threaten to kill the body. And as you know, persecution is going on all over the world against Christians at the present time. And those of you who take Voice of the Martyrs magazine or those of you who have read the uh, deeply sobering book, Blood of the Martyrs, know that all over this world, Christians are being tortured and they're being killed for their very faith because what they're proclaiming is basically this, that there is one king over all kings. There is one Lord over all lords. There is only one way to be reconciled to God, and that is through personal faith in Jesus Christ and trusting him as Lord and Savior. And therefore, they are branded as enemies of the state, and they are branded as hate mongers, and it doesn't matter that the church stands for decency and morality and the institutions of God. All around the earth, people wish the earth was rid of the church. They despise this body. Why? Because they despise the body's head. So, Communist and Muslim regimes have been putting Christian missionaries to death because they know that the kingdom of God is against the kingdoms that men attempt to set up on earth. And I just want to remind you, as Jesus said, uh, in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And that means that you and I have to be prepared to be hated and resisted, ridiculed and misrepresented, and possibly tortured and killed for your allegiance to Jesus Christ. And that is a lot to fear. But Jesus gives us reasons not to fear. And the reason that he gives us not to fear is that he insists that we contrast two fears and see which one is the most important, and two capabilities and see which one is the most serious and two punishments and see which one is the most severe. So, just very quickly, he offers you the fear of man or the fear of God in this passage. And it is the fear of God that we must always set before us. Do we fear God more than we fear people? Do we fear God even more than we fear a person who threatens to kill us? Do you hold God in more reverence and awe than you do any man or woman? You remember that Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the term not only means a dread of the Lord, but it means a reverential awe of the Lord. 
So, brothers and sisters, you have to decide whom will you fear. You'll have to decide whether you want to be known as a God-fearing man or woman. And Jesus addressed this church to Christians. Jesus addressed, I'm sorry, this verse to Christians in his church. And it has in it a threat of hell. Because, of course, there are many professing Christians there. Many professing Christians who uh, believe that they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and in fact do not. And one reason that they do not is because they have not trusted in him alone for their salvation. They're trusting in other things that they do or trusting in things they hope to accomplish or trusting that their good works will far outweigh their bad works. I don't know about you, but I've never reached that point yet because even though I may have good deeds that seem to outweigh bad deeds, I also have a heart that, thank God, none of you can see. I have thoughts that make me shudder that they even occurred to my mind. And furthermore, to say that we could have this kind of uh, merit that outweighs our demerit is, of course, a supreme insult to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if that were the case, he would not have needed to come to die on the cross. He would not have needed to bear the wrath of God, as we sang earlier that he did. So what Jesus is saying here is, know whom you should fear. Because every Christian should fear apostasy. The Apostle Paul did. He said, I beat my body, lest after preaching to others I myself should be a castaway. And uh, even though he had all the assurance in the world of salvation, he wanted to be absolutely certain that he was living out the life of Christ inside him. So fear whom you should fear, says Jesus. Stand with Moses and fear God rather than the Egyptians. Stand with Stephen and fear God rather than the Sanhedrin. Stand with Paul and fear God rather than Nero. Because just as there are two fears, there are two capabilities. And Jesus wants us to consider them. There are people who can kill the body, but that's all they can do. They cannot kill the soul. What Jesus says God can do is so much worse. He can destroy This word destroy is very important because the subject that I announced for tonight is the subject of annihilationism. Annihilationism is the belief that those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ will at some point, either upon death or after they have gone through a period of punishment, finally be eliminated from the universe and they will be destroyed into non-existence. They will be completely annihilated. And this is one of the verses that gives people that impression because what Jesus says here is that God can destroy people in a Uh, in both soul and body. So annihilationists take a verse like this and they believe that the Bible teaches that the end of the wicked is destruction, not eternal torment. However, the word here that is translated destroy is the word apolumi. And Uh, Even though cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Seventh-day Adventists have said that it means to absolutely end the existence of something, that is an untrue exegesis of this word. It never means that in Scripture. It never means to destroy to the place where the thing that uh, is the object of this verb ceases to exist. What it means in Scripture is to ruin or to mar. It's used of the old wineskins in Jesus' parable where it says that the wineskins will be 
broken by the new wine that exerts its uh, pressure and fermentation upon the skins, and the skins will be marred. They will be ruined. It means to be lost. It's used of the prodigal son in the parable about him where it speaks of his being lost. And Jesus himself said about his own body, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Well, his body was not annihilated. As a matter of fact, it did not even see corruption. So the word destroy here refers to something far more serious than the killing of the body or even than the elimination of the body from existence. It refers to ruin. It refers to permanent, irremedial ruin and disaster, something that goes far beyond this temporary earthly existence. It refers to a never-ending ruin of both body and soul. And that brings us to Jesus' third contrast. There are two fears and two capabilities, and there are two punishments. One is simply a persecution that ends by killing. And we know, based on Scripture, that even if we should face such a persecution, that there have been Christian martyrs who have gone before us, who have given us the model as to uh, how to face such things. We know, for example, that Stephen faced those who gnashed their teeth and raced upon him in the Sanhedrin to take him out and stone him by comforting himself in seeing a vision of the Lord Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We know of other martyrs throughout history who have died being burnt at the stake. And they have uh, honored the Lord Jesus Christ in their death. We know that we owe our Bibles, or at least all of our Bibles to uh, uh, all of our Bibles up through the New King James Version, which may properly be called the last of the Tyndale family, to William Tyndale, the brave uh, Christian translator who actually raced across England and then lived in various countries of Europe, always on the run from the church as he was translating the scriptures into the common language. And finally, when the henchmen of Henry VIII caught him and burnt him at the stake, his last words as the flames leapt around him were, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. You never can tell how the Lord's going to do that because Henry's eyes were opened and saw Anne Boleyn. And naturally, that uh, uh, filled him with desire for uh, Anne Boleyn and for an heir to the throne. And he went on to uh, uh, break, of course, with the established church and to establish the Church of England. But the Lord works providentially. And in that... Uh, act of sin on Henry VIII's part in putting away his first wife and taking his second one, Anne Boleyn, he actually opened the way for the Bible to be translated into English and for a series of translations to uh, come forth that have culminated in our New King James Version. But the point is that we, uh, in, in all of these cases, with Stephen and with Tyndale, and with the Apostle Paul, and with everyone else who is currently being persecuted or who has been killed this year because of their Christian faith, that's just a temporal kind of uh, torture. It is a terrible thing to be sure, but it doesn't touch the soul of the person. It's just a killing of the body. Jesus says there is another kind of punishment. He says that there's a worse one. He says that there's an endless punishment of both soul and body in hell. Turn over with me to Matthew 25. There you see the great judgment day scene. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him and He sits on the throne of His glory and the nations are gathered before Him. 
And it says that he will bring the righteous into his kingdom. And in verse 41, if he has a word for the goats that are on his left hand. And he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And at the very end, in verse 46, he says, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, those two words, everlasting and eternal, are the same words. They're the same Greek words. The word is ionios. And ionios is an interesting word because what it means is uh, pertaining to the age to come. Pertaining to the age to come. In other words, what you have when you have eternal life right now You have the life of the age to come. You know God in this present evil age, but your knowing Him now is a foretaste of how you will know Him in the age to come. The life that you have after you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior through faith alone is a life that will go on and on. Well, in just the same way, The opposite of that eternal life, as you see in verse 46, is eternal or everlasting punishment. A punishment of the age to come. A punishment that is perpetual. A punishment that is unending. If you want to see a a very concise contrast that shows you what the passage, what the word Ionios really means, a real good, easy way to see it is to turn to 2 Corinthians 4.18. 2 Corinthians 4.18. Paul is talking about the travails of life here in this body. He's looking forward to the age to come. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 4.18 While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are ionios. In other words, there is our word for eternal again. And it's contrasted with what? Temporary. For a season. It means everlasting. It means unending It means going on and on. Now, brothers and sisters, when Jesus says these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, when he says back in our text, fear him who is able to destroy, meaning ruin permanently both soul and body in hell, we face here the most terrifying and somber of all doctrines. I want to show you various scriptures and as I show you the scriptures I want to be dealing with those even increasingly in the evangelical camp who are maintaining that there is a possibility that annihilationism will in fact occur. In other words, What they are maintaining is that finally uh, people will somehow be punished for a short time and then they will simply be obliterated. Look with me now at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19, tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, meaning to the side of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment, 
in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. I want to point out to you, first of all, that this story, if it is a parable, uh, which there's no reason to think it is, if this, uh, if this story is a parable or whether it is a literal fact, it is taking place before the resurrection. It is taking place while people are still living normal lives on earth, the brothers of the rich man. The five brothers are still going about their business on earth. So in other words, this is a passage that takes place not only before the resurrection, but it takes place in time before Jesus even went to the cross. And it is saying that there is a state of torment now. There is a state of torment now. In other words, this horrifying passage is not even about the hell that will be, because it's talking about a torment of soul before the resurrection of the body. Now, what is interesting is that as we read this passage, we say, surely, if people knew, surely, if people understood, surely, if people had enough evidence, surely, if people's minds could be reached, that no one would choose to go to this kind of place of punishment that exists right now, this very night. But Jesus said, uh, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Brothers and sisters, Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. The best attested fact before the history of photography. And people have presented that fact and their lives have been changed based on the Spirit of God that was given to them when they believed on that fact. Furthermore, they have honored the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives and have been willing to go to their own deaths for His sake. They have been transformed new creatures willing to die for Him. And they have presented very capable arguments to the world for 2,000 years. Why is anybody in a place of torment tonight? if it's all so clear and if it's all so straightforward. They're in a place of torment tonight because they will not come to him that they may have life. They're in a place of torment tonight because they hate the best man who ever lived. They will not receive the best news ever proclaimed. They will reject the love and kindness and mercy of God because they will not say, have thine own way, Lord. They will say, I will have it my way. It will be my way. It will be what I want. So, brothers and sisters, the thing to understand is that people go headlong into this place of torture and torment because they will not receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me for just a moment at John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 36. As you well know, John chapter 3 has the classic gospel verse, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
But I want you to notice John 3.36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In other words, the wrath of God is on him now. The wrath of God is giving him up to what he wants, according to Romans 1, to further and further depravity, further and further rebellion, further and further estrangement from God until at the end of that chapter such people are described as foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And you see them described in your newspapers. And you see them, you see news reports about them on television. And some of them, God help you, you may even know personally. And some of them, may the Lord have mercy on their souls, may even be in your own families. Brothers and sisters, the wrath of God is on them, and this passage says it remains on them. But just as it was poured out in increasingly worse form in this life, so it has been taken to a new level in the torment that they endure when they die. But brothers and sisters, the Bible says there's something worse yet to come. And I would be an unfaithful messenger declaring to you the content of this book if I kept this knowledge from you simply to soothe you and to give you false comfort and to give you peace where there is no peace. Turn a page to John 5, verses 28 and 29. Here's Jesus, and he says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. You see what that's saying? That's not just saying that people have gone to a place of punishment and one day there will be a resurrection of believers only. That is saying that people have gone to a place of punishment. The saints who have died have gone to depart and be with Christ and are alive and present and awake before his throne. But then in the future, both groups have another destiny ahead of them. And that is the rejoining of their either blissful soul or their tortured soul with a body into which they will enter the last state. There will be a resurrection of the just and there will be a resurrection of the damned. In other words, the final judgment will be carried out bodily. Now, let me show you several passages from the book of the Revelation. Please turn with me to Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14. Here is a picture of this future torment. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his arm or on his hand. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever." You would not believe that that little phrase has been so tortuously ripped from its context by those who argue for annihilationism. But what they say is, all right, the fire is going to burn forever and ever, but surely it is a fire that consumes. 
As a matter of fact, one of the champions of annihilationism, Edward Fudge, has written a book called The Fire That Consumes. And so the idea is that whatever is put into the fire will burn up. But the smoke ascends forever and ever as a testimony to the results of God's sufficient punishment. The, the, the forever smoke is a symbol of God's sufficient punishment. Do you buy that? No, you can't buy that. The reason the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever is because of what else it says in verse 11. And they have no rest day or night. They have no rest day or night. You see, they have refused the only rest there is. They have refused the one who said, Come unto me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. They have refused the glorious and beautiful Son of God as he has stretched out his hands to them, and they have said, No, I will not have you to reign over me. And so, brothers and sisters, this interpretation about the smoke ascending forever and ever is a very strained and desperate attempt to simply say that uh, surely God would not, in fact, uh, mete out everlasting punishment. Yes, he would, and I'm going to show you why in just a moment, but I want to show you something that perhaps may strike you as even more shocking, and that is in Revelation 19. Please take a look at Revelation 19. We're going to see a similar passage, but a passage that goes a little bit deeper. Revelation 19. After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Do you see what's being said there? Whatever this organization is, this great harlot, whether as some say it was the Roman Empire, or whether as others say it was Judaism, or whether as others say it is something yet to be in the future, it says he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. You see what's going on? There is a vengeance for God's people, his church, who have been murdered and killed by this organization. And in verse 3, this is what it says the saints say. Again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rises up forever and ever. Can you imagine rejoicing over that? Hallelujah! And her smoke rises up forever and ever. Let me just pause here and say, I don't imagine that any of you were uh, around for the announcement that we had dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we know, of course, that the destruction and the devastation was absolutely horrible. But did you know that from the perspective of the American people, when the announcement came that the bombs had been dropped, there was rejoicing, there was cheering, there was rioting in the streets. And you would have understood it if your father had been killed in World War II, if your brothers had been killed in World War II, if you had seen nearly a whole generation of young men wiped out as happened in England if you had known uh, the terrible uh, extent of the Holocaust as the Jews were taken off to the ovens and six million of them were killed by the Third Reich, the thing that ended World War II was this great devastation. And there was rejoicing that the enemies of this country were finally subdued. Now, of course... Here in that analogy, everything is imperfect because we're all sinful. And the, the dropping of the atomic bomb was an imperfect act. 
and the rejoicing that went on was an imperfect act. But here, we're talking about the perspective of Christians as they contemplate the justice of God. The God who said of his people, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. This is a God who is pouring out retribution for his people. Dr. J.I. Packer even recommends in this day and age that the word punishment is so loaded with emotional freight for people that it's better to use retribution because everybody understands retribution. Everybody understands getting back what you deserve, no more and no less. Everybody understands being repaid according to your deeds, which is what the Lord has promised he will do. And so you have a scene in heaven where they see God's justice being poured out and they praise his justice. Hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That's where it's from, brothers and sisters. In a passage extolling the justice of God over his enemies. So now, what do, what do we say about these things? We obviously have trouble looking at things from God's perspective mostly because we are very soft-hearted, mostly because we do not see wickedness in others or in ourselves as a holy God sees these things. Obviously, we need to know something of the mind of Christ. Well, let me remind you of the mind of Christ by showing you some other passages in Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew 5.22. This is right in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. This is our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. This is the meekest, kindest, most loving man who ever lived. And he says in Matthew 5.22, But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And the word that he uses for hell there is the word Gehenna. It meant the garbage dump outside Jerusalem where fire is burned constantly. Turn over to Matthew 5.29. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Do you have that sense of perspective about sin? Do you have the sense of perspective that you must forthrightly and decisively turn from sins and... Uh, and turn your eyes away or turn your right hand away even to the extent of plucking the eye out or cutting the hand off because to do that as fearful and severe as it may seem is far better than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And again, it is talking about the body after the bodily resurrection. Let's go to Mark, Mark chapter 9, 47 and 48. Mark chapter 9, 47 and 48. Here's how he describes hellfire. If your eye makes you sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It's true that he's speaking of a body there but he's speaking of a body perpetually being eaten by a maggot forever. 
The worm does not die, an ever-living maggot. And the fire is not quenched. It's an ever-burning fire. So it is imagery, just like all of these passages speak of imagery. In other words, when you speak of fire, and when you speak of darkness, and when you speak of wailing and gnashing of teeth, you are speaking in uh, terms that are ultimately indescribable. You are talking about something that is so horrible, it's better to lose the members of your body than to go into it. But the question comes up, and this comes up by even our evangelical brothers who are flirting with annihilationism, and that is, why must it be everlasting? Why must it be eternal? Why can't the punishment be meted out and then the cosmos simply be rid of the offending people. Here is one reason why it is everlasting. Here's why it's everlasting. Because, as I said earlier in directing you to John 3.38, this is a rejection of the most important personage, the most powerful being, the most majestic king, the most valuable being in the whole universe. Why is it everlasting? Because of the infinite worth of the person sinned against. There's another reason that it's everlasting. Because if it was less than everlasting, once you open the door to the fact that it might be less than everlasting, then what you have done is to cheapen the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Here's what I mean. The Lord Jesus' punishment was said by God to provide the only means of satisfaction. It is a sacrifice of infinite worth. What Jesus was doing on the cross was enduring the wrath of God. And if you say, yes, there is a way to satisfy God's wrath other than the cross, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it means my non-existence. It doesn't matter if one day I'll just be completely eliminated, if I will just absolutely be pulverized and will disappear from existence then I can still say there is another way to satisfy the wrath of God. There is another way to make satisfaction to God. God will finally look at where I was and say, I'm satisfied. Brothers and sisters, when you say that, you have just blasphemed the only way that people can be put right with God and that their punishment can uh, be meted out and that satisfaction can be made to a holy God. The Bible says that God bought the church with His own blood. With His own blood. Do you know the true meaning of Christmas? It's going to be time for you to shop for Christmas cards pretty soon. And your Christmas cards are probably going to be having variations on the true meaning of Christmas. The true meaning of Christmas, brothers and sisters, is that God took means to get some blood. God took means to get a body. A body you have prepared for me, the Lord Jesus said. And why? Why was he born? What is the purpose of the incarnation? The purpose of the incarnation was that so the Son of God God, the second person of the Godhead, could come and give his life a ransom for many. He was born to die. The angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And if there's any other way for your sins to be punished that will satisfy God, then that is a cheapening of the very atonement for which God sent his only beloved son. 
And finally, these people deserve everlasting punishment because they do not repent. It's hard for those of you who have repented, perhaps, to realize that they do not repent. It's hard for those of you whose hearts are now made tender by the Lord and you commit the slightest sin and you say, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm not only sorry, Father, for that sin, I'm sorry for the motivation that's underneath that sin and I'm sorry for the secret motivation that may be under the motivation I can tell that's behind that sin. You know what that's like, don't you? But brothers and sisters, don't delude yourself. Those who go into everlasting punishment still hate God. They are not tormented and then they say, oh, I'm sorry. They are not tormented and say, I I now repent. You see, they are still continuing on in everlasting punishment and they are uh, in the same state that they were. Revelation 22.15 describes Who doesn't enter into the final state? They're dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. And they still remain the same. They continually deserve God's wrath. And that explains how we will be able to tolerate all of this and even say, Alleluia. Because, brothers and sisters, these are the unrepentant, constant, unrelenting enemies of God. They hated Him in this life. They hated His church. And they will have what they want. And they will continue what they live. Political cartoonists may scoff at Christianity. But when somebody like the Alatola Khomeini dies, they picture him in. And when somebody like Paul Pop dies, they picture him in hell. Because they instinctively know that there must be a punishment to fit the crime. And I want to assure you that there are gradations of punishment. There are those that will be beaten with few stripes, Jesus said. And so not everyone will have the outpouring of wrath that a Judas will have. And this is a This is an area about which we are extremely unclear, but there will be everlasting punishment for everyone because the unrepentant, constant, unrelenting enemies of God are in hell, and they will hate him forever there. And the object of their hatred will be present there with him because they will be punished in the presence of the Lamb, and they will hate him all the more. Now, what does this mean for you and me? Well, let me say that even though this doctrine of annihilationism has certainly been part of Jehovah's Witness teaching and Seventh-day Adventist teaching for years, and it's, uh, and it's now becoming part of... Uh, the teaching of some evangelicals, including, God helping, one of the greatest Bible teachers of this century, John R. W. Stott. John R. W. Stott has declared himself to be, and this is his word, agnostic about this doctrine. He says that he just at this point does not know whether it is everlasting punishment in the classic traditional sense or if it is annihilationism. I am willing to give Stott some leeway there and understand that that does not affect his other excellent writings and the good that he has done and certainly all that I have learned from him over the years. If you want to read Stott's position in uh, detail, uh, you can uh, procure a book called Evangelical Essentials and basically, it's a it's a uh, it's a dialogue. It's a it's not quite a debate, but uh, there's a famous liberal uh, Anglican pastor named David Edwards, who's a friend of Stott's, and so he and Stott wrote this book in which Edwards would ask him questions about the evangelical faith, 
and it was here that Scott began to confess his own doubts about everlasting, unending punishment. Here's what J.I. Packer, Scott's friend, says about those who embrace annihilationism. He says that an annihilationist's idea of God will miss out on the glory of divine justice and his idea of worship will miss out on praise for God's judgments and his idea of heaven will miss out on the thought that praise for God's judgment goes on and his idea of man will miss out on the awesome dignity of our having been made to last for eternity and in his preaching of the gospel he will miss out on telling the unconverted that their prospects without Christ are as bad as they possibly could be. They are as bad as they possibly could be. Because, in the annihilationist view, they aren't. The annihilationist view is, someday it'll all be over. I can hang on during the torment, and someday I'll just cease to exist, and that'll be bliss. But it won't be a bliss, of course, that he knows about. So, the, uh, the, the point is that the weakening of this doctrine will weaken our evangelical fervor. It will weaken our desire and zeal to tell people that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. That what Christianity has been proclaiming for two millennia is true that Jesus is the only way to God and there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, for I also trust are well known in your consciences. In other words, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I would much rather persuade men and women to come to Jesus by simply showing them how wonderful he is. By simply showing them all of the blessings and the benefits of knowing this wonderful, omnipotent, omniscient, and thoroughly loving Savior. This is the same Jesus who said, Suffer the little children to come unto me. This is the same Jesus who fed 5,000. This is the same Jesus who said to Jairus' his daughter, Honey, get up. This is the same Jesus who said to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. This is the same Jesus who comforted Peter after the resurrection when Peter was so fearful because he denied him three times and Jesus forgave him. It is that wonderful Lord Jesus from whose lips we have the most terrifying descriptions of him. And therefore, this is a matter of life and death for you and me. And why shouldn't it be? Because it was a matter of life and death for Jesus. It was a matter of life and death for Jesus. You see, we sang earlier about his saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that point that he took the wrath of God. It was at that point that he underwent hell. You may be interested to know that the Apostles' Creed did not have the phrase, he descended into hell when it was first formulated. So the, the Apostles' Creed, uh, with which many of you are familiar, says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And then the next phrase that was added somewhat later after the Apostles' Creed came into use is, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he, he ascended into heaven, and so forth. John Calvin in his Institutes was explaining the Apostles' Creed. And he explained it in the form that we have it today. But the way he explained it was to explain it as if he was crucified and he descended into hell and was dead and buried because Calvin knew and you know from reading your Bibles 
that Jesus went through hell on the cross for six hours as God departed from him and he was made a substitute sinner for you and me and it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Why would it please the Lord to bruise his son? Why would it please the Lord to send him through hell so that you might not go to hell? For just that reason, he loves you. He loves you. And he has paid the price to keep you from everlasting punishment. How do you and I receive this? Well, certainly this is so awesome and so majestic that any other thought of simply, other than simply taking hold of Jesus, must be absolutely cast out. The Bible says that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and once we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him alone and in his finished work before our Father, an amazing thing happens. God justifies us. He pronounces you righteous. He regards you as if you never sinned and as as if you were positively good. He regards you as like Jesus himself with all of the status of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what we have to proclaim to sinners. Recently there was a question in Christianity Today posed to Dr. Stanley Grins, and the question was, is hell forever? And Dr. Grins closed his answer to the question by saying this, the controversy surrounding the nature of eternal damnation will serve a positive purpose if it leads us to realize that we ought never to speak about the fate of the lost without tears in our eyes. Brothers and sisters, this should inspire us to further witnessing, inspire us to further evangelism, knowing the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, and it should fill us with a new appreciation for our Lord Jesus Christ, that love so amazing, so divine, should demand our soul and our lives and our all. Check out our websites, biblequery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. Historycart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 